by the Williams Treaty. We are grateful for the opportunity to work here and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contribution of Métis and other indigenous people in shaping and strengthening this community. All right, we will move on with the adoption of minutes or the agenda and we have an uh, adjustment to the agenda um, first one being that we have an extra set of minutes to approve and the second one being that we're moving item 3.3 up on the agenda so that donna will be able to leave so may i have someone move the uh, the changed agenda please uh, first hand I saw was Ian and the second was Skip. So we'll go with that. All those in favor. All right, carried. So are there any declarations of pecuniary interest for the item relating to the items on our agenda this evening? There being none. We will proceed. So we have the minutes of the May 5th Municipal Heritage Committee meeting. Has everyone had a chance to read them? May I have a mover and a seconder for those minutes, please? Sandy moves and skips seconds. All those in favor? Carried. We also have the minutes of the June 2nd meeting. May I, has everyone had a chance to read the fact that it wasn't, uh, didn't happen? <laughs> so hopefully we can have uh, someone move the acceptance of these minutes as well. And and someone to second them, please. Ian, all those in favor? Thank you. So as stated, we are going to move item 3.3, which is a cultural center feasibility study presentation forward in our meeting. And Donna, I welcome you and ask you to proceed with your presentation, please. Wait, before, before Donna goes, John needs to introduce himself first. Oh, John has to introduce himself. I'm sorry. Because we missed, we missed the, sorry, John. No, no worries, <laughs> all, all good. I'll, I'll, make it, I'll make it brief and uh, succinct here. So yes, good, uh, good day, uh, Heritage Committee. My name is Jonathan Dewars. I'm a planner two here with the municipality. I am I'm filling uh, the rather large shoes that Mr. David Harding left behind. He has moved on to another position uh, with the city of Vaughan. So he is uh, dearly missed in the planning office and I will do my best to uh, keep up the good work that he has, he has um, conducted. Um, uh, just a quick, I guess, brief about me. Uh, I've been with the municipality for just over two years. I uh, moved here from <clears throat> the city of Saskatoon where I was practicing uh, planner with the city of Saskatoon for about seven years. Moved out here middle of or not the middle of I guess the, the first quarter, if you will, of the pandemic and have been here ever since. And uh yeah, if you have any questions planning related, um please feel free to, to reach out and I will do my best to offer advice, suggestions or background uh planning relate on planning related matters. Um, and yeah, that's that's me. And we invite you to participate in any of the discussions um, as you are one of our advisors. So please feel free if there's something you need to contribute to ask to speak. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Welcome. <laughs> and we hope that we have a long and profitable friendship. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much. So Donna, sorry, second time I'm coming to you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, no problem. Would, you, 
Would you proceed then with your presentation? Sure. Yeah, and thank you very much for pushing me up. Thursdays, I'm Tuesdays are really the only bad kind of kid day, horseback riding and swimming and on and on and on. So, so I do appreciate being pushed up a bit. Um, uh, Emily, I can share screen. Okay. All right, let's get this. Hopefully it'll go from the beginning. Ah, perfect. All right. Um, so, uh, some of you, uh, if you were able to um, uh, catch the committee the whole meeting last week, you will have already seen most of this. Um, if you weren't able to catch the committee the whole meeting, then um, uh, this is what was presented. And it goes to council on the 21st. And so we're kind of in a in-between period right now. Um, so these are the findings of the Cultural Center Feasibility Study. And I'm, as you guys all know, Athel was the representative for the um, Kawartha Lakes Culture and Heritage Network, and he was vice chair of the committee as well. So he's um, he had the inside scoop, but it was presented to the task force before it became part of the committee, the whole um, presentation, and then also here today. So, um, all right, so I'll get moving here. Uh, so the um, the kind of background for the feasibility study is probably 10 years in the making. And there were various conversations happening. There was, um, from what I understand, uh, it was before, before I started working for the city, but there was um, sort of an all candidates meeting that happened in 2015 um, with, or 20, sorry, 2018 with the election about cultural center and all things cultural that was done through the um, Kawartha Lakes Arts Council. And then between 2017 and 2019, there was a working group that sort of did a vision for a cultural center. And then um, through uh, uh, money that was brought forward by the Kawartha Lakes Arts Council and the Kawartha Culture and Heritage Network, uh, they petitioned council to match the dollars and strike a task force and actually do this feasibility study. So that's how we got to uh, 2019. Uh, that's when it was October 29th, 2019, when um, that deputation came to council and council agreed to match the dollars. And uh, January of 2020, the task force was struck and uh, just as we were going to be um, issuing the RFP and getting the, the task force up and running, uh, uh, COVID hit and pretty much closed everything down. Then uh, from there, the both organizations uh, sent a letter to the city asking to postpone the program for a year uh, because of the sort of tumultuous nature and the inability to really assess buildings and, and get together to, to um, sort of calm, you know, converse and sort of figure out how this was gonna work. So truly we didn't actually get going until April of uh, 20, um, sorry, yeah, April of 2021. And so council did strike a task force to shepherd the study and um, from there, uh, of course, their terms of reference was extended, the, the, the actual appointments were extended, uh, we had sort of people come and go, um, there was a lot of kind of moving and shaking, but eventually our uh, trusty band of cultural activists and counselors were able to shepherd this study forward. So Sue Taylor from the Kawartha Lakes Arts Council was chair, again, as I said, Alpha Hart, was um, vice chair. Uh, Patrick Murphy and Barb Doyle were community members at large. Uh, we did have Diane Lister, who was a representative from the creative economy. And she helped, she was the committee rep for the RFP. And she sort of got the consultants hired and, and kind of got that all up and running. And then uh, she had to resign because she moved to Kingston. And you have to be a resident of the municipality to be on a task force. So unfortunately we lost her, although she certainly played a large part and a large role in getting us where we are today. And also Beverly Jeeves, she was originally um, the rep for the Culture and Heritage Network. And then um, with Athol, 
uh, taking over, he became the rep. And so, and then I was the recording secretary for the task force and project manager of the RFP and then of the subsequent um, hiring of Nordic City and JIMO. And then we also developed an interdepartmental technical team that acted as staff support because this certainly did cross a lot of different departments. So the process was based on this municipal facility analysis and master plan framework. And building a property use this. This is a fairly standard um, framework that's used in facility analysis and planning. And really what the, um, the framework was engaged to ensure that the analysis was based on current demand and future demand to plan and to manage for that change. Because as we all know, the municipality is, is expected to grow by another 30,000 people. And that changes the landscape dramatically from a, from a really rural to starting to get to be almost a mid-sized municipality. And so the demands and the um, interchange with ratepayers um, sort of changes with that expansion. So the findings to be presented reflect that process and they gave valuable information um, that will inform our next steps um, if council agrees with the report and also adopts the recommendations. So as I said before, Notre Dame City and JIMO were the uh, successful consultants and the study was completed between September and May. The vision, which was taken out of the Cultural Center Working Group, uh, their document that was drafted in 2017, 2018, was that uh, the cultural center needs to respond to the space needs reported by the city and the cultural sector. And this would be done through a viable operating model that invites Corth Lakes cultural organizations and artists to share space and programming assets. So the center will celebrate Corth Lakes rich culture and heritage assets and support greater access to those. House and showcase cultural assets and content of its partners as desired. And it will be a fit for purpose for long-term care and management. The uh, center should provide support to the broader culture and creative sector, uh, which is seeking affordable and accessible yet professional space to create and practice, and also respond effectively to community cultural and heritage uses. So have it sort of built purpose built and adaptable to be able to grow and change as the municipality does itself. So, oh, I don't know why it says that. Oh, had some formatting changes here. Anyway, so there were design guidelines and standards that GIMO brought forward with the um, with their involvement, and uh, th these are sort of um, a bit of sort of motherhood type guidelines and standards, and they fit perfectly with what we're trying to achieve. So, so we want to support culture through that design excellence. We want to leverage heritage for placemaking a social, economic, and environmental sustainability. So sort of that leave no footprints, designing with indigenous communities. So Curve Lake has been, um, uh, we've had consultation with Curve Lake. They had the draft interim report. They've also have the final report. Um, there's an ex, there's sort of, um, sort of an exciting opportunity for them to be part of phase two uh, with site selection. Um, there's a similar model that they did with the Canoe Museum in Peterborough that we're hoping to implement um, to ensure that it is truly um, more, more than just consultative, that's actually collaborative and that there's a, um, definitely a kinship that happens. And then also um, design with archive and collection storage. So, and they felt that regardless of the size, scale and the construction method, the final location selection and design of the cultural hub should align with these guidelines and it is detailed within the actual study. So the findings of uh, Norda City and JIMO, they did 200 and they received over 220 surveys. They did um, 10 to 12 one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews and they held two focus groups. And uh, that was actually over and above what was required uh, through the RFP uh, because a lot of that work had been done by Deb Sewell and by the Cultural Center Working Group. Um, before the RFP and before the task force was struck. So it was kind of done to sort of validate the hunch, validate the work that had been done previously, and also to make sure that five years later, 
that if there were things and nuances, uh, differences, that they were picked up through that consultative process. So the findings that they found was the, um, they recommend uh, is a recommendation on a feasible size range with two options for a cultural hub, so a medium and a large. Uh, no site specific or a specific site was identified as feasible at the time. However, the location analysis uh, does provide insights into key factors that should be further considered. And so that's uh, sort of will be um, explored in phase two with a site selected uh, during phase two. Because uh, if we do apply for things like the Canada Cultural Spaces Fund, you do, you do need to actually have a site selected. Um, it's part of their process. It's part of their um, their uh, eligibility criteria. And they also feel that the configuration is a cultural center with an archive and collections facility. So it's collaborative, but it's also a bit of a separate project. Um, and it will provide economies of scale to develop a viable, viable financial model. So the the um, if you did catch the committee of whole uh, meeting, um, the life cycle of the archive uh, and records building right now is sort of halfway through its life cycle, uh, especially for its sort of steel frame building. And then in addition to the um, work that has been occurring since last March with council's direction to hire a collections and our sort of a curatorial staff, which Laura is on the call today, and that's the result of that direction. So it's fantastic. Um, so the, so the work is actually um, for records, uh, for archive and for collections is expanding. And the, in addition to all of this fantastic stuff that's been going on, the, um, with the growth that's happening in Lindsay specific, the water treatment plant, it looks like it might be starting to um, have to expand. And so therefore it was sort of, bit of a perfect storm in the sense that it, it was identified during the study that we will need a new archive and collections facility building. And because of that, the addition of the sort of cultural center side into one amalgam um, makes that economies of scale. So in financing, we're looking at through, on of course, Trillium, uh, Rural Economic Development, Canada Cultural Spaces Fund, um, and other sort of, usually for buildings like this, it's kind of a tri-government funding. So federal, provincial, and municipal. And that's sort of where we are. Do you have any questions? Ron? Thanks. Um, just a question um, I had there um, about um, Donna there about this, the whole cultural master plan what I was told was that it's going to be modeled after a hub and spoke type of a model. Would that mm -hmm. be, is that what the, the whole um, thrust of the, of the idea is as a hub and spoke type of system? Yeah, so what the, the um, uh, I kind of picture it a bit like, a, like I kind of picture it a bit like a, a, a vase, I guess. So at the very, very top, when we were doing the cultural master planning, I guess with Deb Sewell and all of that work that had been done, it was identified that um, that shared curatorial space was um, as was uh, desired. And so that, that sort of is what started percolating that central hub, that central um, you know, sort of cultural center. And then the programming and the relationship between the hub and the outline um, not-for-profits that we have throughout the municipality would be of uh, help with, with looking after um, sort of these fragile or sort of, like I know Kirkfield talks about the, the chair that they have of, of one of the reeves that's too big for their actual facility to, to actually house. Like it's, it's all of those different types of oddities that happens with curatorial services and artifacts, but programming also. So for the municipality to actually do some cultural programming and some, some workshops some training, some different things like that. So, so it's, that's sort of the hub and spoke model. When, when the study was done, it was found that, especially through the 220 surveys, which were mostly from residents, um, 
and less so from the actual organizations. It was also found that there was this, there was this sort of hole in the cultural offerings that, um, that is much more arts and culture driven than culture and heritage driven. And it is that weaving, it is that workshops, that shared space, that, that maker space that a lot of municipalities have through their library system that Corth Lakes doesn't currently have. Um, you know, the lays, the saws, the, the being able to throw pots and being able to learn how to do glazes. And, and also, um, like I know Pat Murphy, he's part of that 65 piece brass band and they don't, there's no place for them to actually all get together, all 65 of them. There isn't a space large enough to be able to practice. And so, or that isn't so large that you'd actually do be like a performance hall. We don't want, there was no need for that, right? So it's that kind of in between that, that surfaced and resulted through all of those surveys. So the Kirkfield, Maryborough Lodge and, and Boyd Museum were identified as sort of spoke. They're, they have, um, Kirkfield has a brand new, beautiful renovated church area. Boyd has gotten space back from the library moving at Miraburo Lodge is um, already does a lot of events, has sort of activation spaces, whether it's the schoolhouse, whether it's the, the grounds, the park next door. And so, and there's the, the, some of the discussion happened was that that activation, that programming, it doesn't need to wait for this collections and curatorial and sort of cultural facility to be built. Because that could be five to 10 years down the road, depending on um, construction, depending on site selection, depending on that. So that programming can start as soon as we start to figure out how we can partner with those organizations. Um, and if there are other organizations that that didn't um, didn't sort of throw their hat in the wing or, or weren't <laughs> available at the time, if they were private, if they were under construction, if they were whatever, um, then also we can have to start having kind of those discussions. Um, but yeah, that hub and spoke model is still at play. Um, it's, it'll be based on, uh, from a collections facility, it would be based on the other organizations wanting to enter into that shared agreement, that shared space. Mm -hmm. And from a programming perspective, it'll be the ability to actually sort of figure out how to program um, to those other organizations and figure out kind of how that partnership will work. One, one more location. I was yeah. I met with uh, James Barrett with the Lakeview yeah. Arts Bar and they were very interested in being a partner. Can they participate in, would they be able to participate in this? They're, they're certainly keen on it. They're, you know, they're a 7,000 square foot building, the Lakeview Arts Bar, they, 20, 21 acres um, there. Yeah, so, well, uh, if they're successful in their campaign, their capital campaign right now, uh, then they will actually have a structure to be able to participate. When the study was happening, the Lakeview Arts Barn is actually a private for-profit event center. And it, so it's, it's private, but the other one in Bob Cage and the Globus Theater, that's a that's a registered charity, but but yeah, you're right. right. The Lakeview Arts Barn is it is private. But, but they, they they have offered their facilities and their location that I, I they seem quite interested yeah. in, in but being partners. But I think um Councillor Ashmore, what's so exciting about that is this capital campaign that they've launched, what they're doing is they're actually trying to raise the money for Globus to be able to buy the barn. Right. Yeah. And then it will become a nonprofit. And then if that changes, then that whole discussion changes. Because um, at the moment the partnerships with cultural facilities and with heritage locations and with all of that is based on that nonprofit model. Um, otherwise, we would actually be renting space in a for profit, and someone would be profiting off of. And so that that's why the Lakeview Arts Barn wasn't looked at as an actual spoke because it's private. But if they're successful and they're able to buy the building and turn it into the Globus, the lab becomes Globus, then that's a totally different conversation. And um, yeah, and I'll certainly talk to James or, or Sarah. Yeah, if you don't mind, yeah. that'd be great, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Dan? <clears throat> uh, just to clarify, Donna, I've heard mm -hmm. a lot of people and I've, a few people have asked me in the community, 
they're concerned um, when you're talking about the archive space that um, places like Boyd would be um, forced basically to move some of their records to the archive space. My understanding is that's oh. the case. Yeah. No. Oh. No, uh, sorry, you just shifted on my screen here. Yeah. No, um, what, uh, what I think that um, what they might be talking about is, is that there are some organizations that have active municipal records. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of two conversations that are happening, but I think they're kind of blurring out in the community. So there mm -hmm. are some, there are some organizations, but maybe it's Boyd, I, I'm like I don't, I don't know specifically. That would be more for Angela, um, but they actually are active records. Like they, they're part of our municipal corporate. So legally, they need to come back. But that doesn't. That's a totally separate conversation than the cultural center and the archival and rec and collections facility. And I've talked to Barb um, at length about this because I kind of picture it like. Um, almost like a, you know, like a used store, you know, where you, where you can rent a space and you can store your furniture while you're moving or, or whatever. So of course there's like, I'm, I'm just saying that that's sort of what I picture. Like I picture that um, fob access that municipal buildings have. I picture that safe space that, that, you know, sort of do dock in and dock out. So people know who's in that space. Like there are some, there are some artifacts that need like, you know, two degrees Celsius, mm -hmm. like microfilm, you know, or, or something like that. And not every uh, nonprofit in Corth Lakes can afford or have the space or have the technical ability in, within their buildings. So that's the kind of uh, expertise that Laura brings. That's the kind of shared space that we're talking about. And it's completely um, voluntary. It's completely uh, the organization has a need. The municipality will be having this space for their own collection because that's a sort of standard protocol type of, of um, quality control that municipalities have. And so if organizations like the Void have, a, have an article or an artifact that is so um, sensitive or careful or needs to be maintained in a certain way and they cannot do it, then they will have the ability to do it through us. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. So I know thank now when I'm getting questions, how to answer people. So yeah. There are people in the community or that are thinking because of this, the Boyd is going to be forced to send things to the city. So no. I now and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, if anything, we're talking to the Boyd about using that space that the library has vacated Boy, to no. actually no. like activate. Yes. If, you know, so it's kind of the reverse, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Super. Thanks. I just wanted a little bit of clarification. Make sure that I'm not misspeaking when I'm yeah. trying to explain to people. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Ian. Yes. Just following up on on Anne's point, in the last five, six, seven years or so that this cultural center conversation has been happening. My understanding is that one of the functions of a centralized facility, wherever that centralization might be, is that each of the spokes would have the opportunity to use part of that space to sort of exhibit a portion of their own collection mm -hmm. to highlight a particular theme that they are addressing in their curatorial plans. And, and that, way, that way people coming into this, uh, this new centralized facility could be directed, you know, up to Fenland Falls, or they could be directed up to Kirkfield or Bob Cajun or Manvers or wherever. And uh, the centralized facility would sort of function as, you know, go and see this museum or that museum, as opposed to sort of absorbing everything or replacing anyone. And I think the feasibility study findings make that quite clear. Yes, you're right, Ian, for sure. Yeah, and there's, we're picturing sort of, um not a grand hall as in like audacious, but like a, a open space um, where temporary um, public art, where temporary traveling exhibits can be pulled from, where the 10 organizations can actually pull um, artifacts from their collection that tell like say a similar story. 
And so that you're able to share a little bit of each location within this central sort of grand space. And then yes, exactly, push them out to the actual museums and cultural sites that, that, that tell that larger story. Um, so for sure, yeah. Yeah, it's really, um, and it's very much sort of a, a cultural rather, like it's not a museum, it, it, it's not, um, it has nothing to do with that. It, it has to do with uh, the facilitation of a great space that protects our archives, our artifacts, our 2D and 3D relics. On top of that, it also provides a space for growth for community services, for cultural services, for neighborhood development, um, things like um, we were talking about weaving and being learning how to dye fabric. And then um, the, the, um, the holding, uh, pot, the holding tanks that you would have to have before you were able to process that type of, of chemical and that type of material. Like you're picturing a big space um, to do those really interesting um, artist-based and, and sort of creative economy-based activities that, that does not exist in the municipality at the moment. So it really is sort of filling a hole and filling a need. I think that's from a, from a planning perspective, if I may jump in here, um, yeah. Ethel, I think that's really great. Uh, the hub model, the hub and spoke model, I think is great. And I really appreciate that you touched on uh, a musical component as well, because sometimes that is overlooked as like a, like a heritage or cultural component music is. So I think that's really great, you know, having the potential to have bands maybe perform there or um, do demonstrations there or something. I think that's that's really neat. And it's going to be a big, a large space. Um, and I think through the architecture and design process, there's a great opportunity to involve other creative agencies, um, mm -hmm. perhaps indigenous inspired architecture or design elements throughout the building. I think that's very important. Yeah, and, and actually, Jonathan, you mentioned a good point. So we were talking about partnerships and sort of that hub and spoke with the heritage, but that also happens, say, with the Boys and Girls Club, because they have a recording studio in the Boys and Girls Club facility and the Academy, right? The Academy is a large, it's a large performance hall. You know, it's over 400 people seating. It's a totally different scale, but there's a lot of workshops like Lindsay Little Theatre and Globus and The Grove, like they're all looking for for practice space and it doesn't really exist. There's only so many church basements and even them, they're not really configured properly to be able to actually practice a full ensemble, whether it's music, whether it's art, whether it's drama. And so that sort of black box idea, people think that, oh, they're gonna be doing a performance hall, but it's actually um, the opposite. It's the, it sort of is a creative um, breeding ground to then be able to go out into the community and go to the academy or go to the Grove or, or go to Peterborough or wherever. Like we, we have a, an actually identified bleed from dance um, companies, from music, from all of those types of things. They will actually go to Peterborough and rent their facilities to do their, their end of year celebrations when all the parents and grandparents and friends can go and see their children we don't have that. We have it in the academy, and I know that we do some, but there, it's oversubscribed. There's more need than the demand that we have right now, actually, in the facilities that we have. So, it's quite exciting, actually. It's going to be really fun. Do I have any other questions? Well, thank you, Donna, for bringing your presentation right. to us. It's been a fun process that we've gone through and uh, uh, your explanations have been really enlightening to people and they do show the intent of the task force and the study. Yeah. So I appreciate yeah. that very much. And- Well, thank uh, you for having me, everyone. Thank you, thank you Donna. All right, so now we'll move back into. Uh, we, we need a motion to receive. Oh, sorry. I'm not, I've lost everything. There's nothing on my screen. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep, you're still there. We just need a motion to receive Donna's presentation. 
So what I'm telling you is I can see nothing at the present moment. So somebody else is going to have to look uh, for hands because there's I can nothing do on that. my screen. Uh, so Ian moves and Ann seconds. All right, all those in favor. And that's everybody, so carried. Thank you. I'm glad you can hear my voice because I can still see nothing on my screen. It's totally blank. <laughs> I've never had this before. Anyway, let's move on with the next uh, presentation, which is the alteration application for 50 Oak Street, Fenland Falls, which is um, the Fenland Museum, Maryborough Lodge. So Angela, I would like to ask you to proceed with your presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I don't know what is the easiest way. I'm not sure if uh, I know there's quite a large drawing package if everyone uh, was able to print a copy, if you want me to share a screen and just go through it digitally, um, which would be the easier option here. Probably share your screen. So I only sent out the elevation drawings. I didn't send okay. out all the, you know, the foundation stuff. Because okay. it's I, that's not really heritage <laughs> heritage type stuff. Uh, so I just I just sent out the elevation drawings to everybody with the agenda package. So may I just interrupt for a moment to say that I'm going to try to leave. Uh, I don't even see any box that I can do that, but I'm going to try and leave and come back in. Okay, Ethel, I'll just chair the meeting until you get back. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. Um, I know we have touched on this project uh, in the past at uh, committee meetings um, over the last few years. This has been in the work since roughly 2018. We had a capital project at that time. Um, there was a feasibility study to address the needs uh, of the museum, um, their programming, and what they were um, kind of their, their future planning, what they were looking to do with the space. Um, what was identified was the need for uh, some accessibility. Um, they do have the front, um, kind of the big doors here that open up into a parlor space, but there's quite a, a threshold there to get over. So they don't meet accessibility um, standards. So this project over time has kind of uh, developed to where we are. There's been many consultations with the museum board. Um, the, the actual size of this edition has shrunk. Um, it was going to be originally bigger they've their needs have kind of changed i think with COVID and everything they, they've been able to maybe reevaluate a bit so we've we've shrunk the size so we're basically matching the existing footprint the entrance that is there currently is not in good condition it's in a disrepair um, there's different foundations from the existing um log cabin basically and then, and then this little add-on that it's almost separating from the building. So there, there's construction concerns or safety concerns. Um, and doing this, we can now bring in um, proper accessibility. So there'll be door operators, there's proper turning radiuses um, to at least get folks into the main floor of the building um, to be able to, to visit and, and uh, see what they have on display there. So I won't necessarily bore you. This is just the site plan, just showing the area of work, just zooms in on the site plan. Um, demolition. So just this is the entrance It's on the east side of the building. So it's just showing basically what's there, what's going to be demolished. So the elevations, I think, Emily, this is what you said you had shared part of this. Um, so, I mean, it, it's pretty well replicating what is there. Um, there are some changes with um, just the windows on the, what is the north wall? There's currently windows all the way across. Um, the museum board has asked that that just be a solid wall to allow for more shelving, more display area. So we've accommodated that. So there is no windows along this wall but they will have plenty uh, on the east side. Um, this elevation here shows um, the door that will be replaced. Currently, there's a screen door that uh, 
you open one way and then you, you open the other door to go into the building. Unfortunately, that doesn't meet accessibility standards. But what we will do is um, replace it with a, a heritage replica design door. Um, I should have started too with the consultant. We're working with Stephen Burgess Architects, SBA. They specialize in heritage buildings. So they know, um, you know, kind of the era that we're working with and they know how to replicate and make sure that we are staying true to, um, you know, the, the, the design, the, the period of the building. Um, so there's this one here is a bit more close up zoom in of, of the door. It will have the operator, um, power opener, um, technical construction drawings. Um, some of this is getting into mechanical and electrical. Um, it's minor enough. Um, the lighting will be, what is their approved lighting? LED lighting. Um, it'll meet museum standards. Um, along with the windows, they will be covered with a UV um, protectant film just to protect um, you know, whatever they may choose to display within the space. Um, this is all just technical stuff. This drawing here shows that we've maintained the turning radius for a wheelchair to come in. So that meets accessibility standards. Lighting will be track lighting so that they can point and move all the little heads in different directions for areas they want to highlight. And that that's the extent of the drawing. So probably of most interest is back to the floor plans and elevations. Um, the other part of the package was the, the actual technical special specifications. It's like 178 pages long. I'm not going to lie, I haven't read all of it either. I have skimmed through it to um, pick up on the highlights, um, but we do have the consultant on board that uh, is providing contract administration throughout the, the process as well. So um, my contact is Ashley Stewart at SBA. And as I say, she's well versed in the, the heritage designation of it. So currently, um, the heritage permit application is with um, your committee. We have been granted exception from site plan control. That was done a couple of years ago. Building permit application is in um, just the end of last week. So obviously pending um, heritage permit. And um, it is posted through the city's procurement division on our bids and tenders uh, website for interested parties to come out and bid on the job. And our site meeting is next week. Proposed construction is going to be the fall of 2022. So that's kind of the overview highlight. If there's any questions, I can try to certainly answer them for you. I'd like to thank you for the sensitive way you've uh, done the addition to the architecture that exists there at Mary Lodge. It's uh, uh, the roof pitches and lines are very very sensitive to the existing and uh, personally i think it's a wonderful plan thank you there, there has been certainly lots of discussion and lots of input from the, the members of the of the museum board um and that was certainly something i mean it, it it ties into the existing porch roof um just kind of working with the scale of the windows that are there um sba has done a great job in taking all that into consideration so I'll open the floor to questions. Are there any questions for Angela? Seeing none, I would like a mover to accept what the presentation that Angela has given to us for information. I have Ian and a seconder is Anne. All those in favor. Emily, would you like us to proceed uh, to make a motion regarding the approval of these drawings for? Uh, you should heritage? really be doing it. You should really be doing it as one motion, just so it's cleaner for the minutes. Okay. So to receive the presentation and to and approve the yeah. plans for this addition to Maryborough Lodge. So does anyone have any reason to change their vote? <laughs> 
There being none, we'll make it all as one motion. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Angela. Thank you for your time. And uh, I'm going to hop off now. I have to go get kids as well. So uh, I will wait uh, to hear from Emily further on this then. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right, moving on to the next uh, application um, is 3.2, which is a building property update from from Jocelyn and she wasn't able to make Jocelyn, it. So yeah. we're gonna have to defer that. So I'll we'll have to defer it. Do you need a motion? Um, yeah, if the committee could just make a motion to defer to a later meeting. All right, could we table this in presentation until a future meeting? Do I have someone who's willing to move that? Anne is willing to move it, and Jim is willing to second it. All those in favor? Thank you. Carried. All right, we have uh, a building and property update. Is that part of that, or are you doing that, Emily? No, that's part of the present. That's just the report that goes with the presentation. So we'll just okay. move on to the next. So we'll move on to um, reports. And the first one is the heritage planning update. Okay, so that's me. Um, so just a few things uh, on the report, uh, just a quick summary here. Uh, so at May, the May 17th council meeting, council approved the designation of the train station in Kobe, which is great. Uh, and the amendment to the designating bylaw for 746 Janetville Road. Um, so the notices have been sent out and the bylaws will come forward to council in July. Um, council also passed the designating bylaw for 1590 Elm Tree Road um, and then the repeal and replace for the old jail. So those are, are done, um, which is great. Uh, the next thing is committee the whole on June 7th. Um, so council received the report on listing a number of properties. Uh, so council approved the listing of the majority of them. There were a couple that council pulled from that list just because uh, the owners requested that they be removed. Uh, so that was what council decided to do. Um, so that will come forward to from the committee the whole to council next Tuesday on the 21st for ratification. Um, and once that's done, the notices will be sent out. Uh, the only other thing on here is just an FYI for Historic Places Day. So this is something that the National Trust for Canada does every day. Um, and that's running between July 7th and 31st. They have a website. Um, there are a few places in Kawartha Lakes on the Historic Places Day. Um, and there's also stuff in our region that you can go visit. So I would recommend that everybody check that out. And that's it. Um, Anne? I'm sorry, I didn't get to watch the committee at the whole. What properties were pulled from the listed, Emily? So they were 17 John Street in Bellin Falls, which is the Lockmaster's house. Um, 14, oh God, what's the address? Hold on, let me check. Uh, one in, there's one in Bethany and then another one. Uh, I thought I could pull it off the top of my head there, but obviously, <laughs> obviously the addresses are blanking. Um, I have it here. Maybe just give me one second. Okay, do, 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 listing properties. Now my computer's thinking about it here. Okay, the properties are 106 Elm Tree Road, which is the uh, Valencia Community Church, and then 1464 Highway 7 in Bethany, which is just, it's just a house. Um, that was, it's just a Victorian house. It's nothing uh, particular. Um, yep, so those are the three that they pulled. Was there any uh, reason given why the Lockmaster's house in Venom Falls should not be designated? Or yeah, because the, be the, the owners didn't want it to be. That's the rationale for all three properties. And that's council's, that's council's decision. Hmm. Interesting. Any other questions? Nope, just thanks, Emily. So may I have someone move the acceptance of the report from Emily? Ian is moving it. May I have a seconder? Councillor Ashmore, all those in favor? 
carried. So the next item on our agenda is the Old Mill Heritage Conservation District study. And once again, I hand that back to you, Emily. All right, so I did a little PowerPoint on this one uh, because I was like, oh God, you don't just wanna hear me, <laughs> hear me talk about this without having to look at something. So I'm gonna share my screen um, and I will just run through the study with everybody um, and the recommendations. So I'm assuming everybody read the 200 page study that, <laughs> or not, um, but this is, this is the overview. Okay. Um, so as I'm sure everybody knows, we have the old Mill Heritage Conservation District study that we started in 2020. Um, and this is the study coming out of it, which is really exciting. So that's finally finished. Um, this was a request from members of the community um, who live there. So we received it uh, in 2018. It, uh, a petition came to council. Um, it was brought back to this committee in 2019 and it came back to council in 2020 and council initiated the study at that time. So this is the study area. Um, that uh, that was covered by the study. It's that area um, just on the south side of the Scugog River, um, bounded by Lindsay Street South and Durham Street East. Um, oh yes, and so here's the background. So uh, the other background on this was it was identified as having heritage value during the downtown Lindsay Heritage Conservation District study. Um, so that's really where the idea to make this into a, a potential district came about. Um, and the main significance of the area was the fact that it was the original settlement site of Lindsay, so Purdy's Mills, um, which was located within this area. Um, the mill itself is at the foot of Georgian Street, um, and it also contains a large number of historic residential properties. So just looking through there, um, even without um, the information on, you know, Purdy's Mills and what happened there back in the 1830s, um, there are a lot of Victorian and Edwardian properties there as well. So it has some architectural significance in that way. Um, so the study process, just to run through how it, how it all happened, um, the study was done by staff and a subcommittee from this committee, which was great. So we didn't hire a consultant to do it um, because we have, we have the expertise in house to do this. So there's really no reason to hire externally. Um, it started in summer of 2020, um, so correspondence was sent out to property owners. And we also had two public meetings in August. Um, now, with the help of the subcommittee, uh, we, we valiantly undertook, <laughs> undertook field surveys uh, in the winter of 2020 and 2021. Um, and Ian can attest to how cold it was uh, when he and I went out for, <laughs> for some of the days. Uh, so uh, good job everybody for getting this done through the winter. Um, and we documented all the properties in the study area. At the same time, uh, background research was undertaken to develop the history of the area, just so we know what, ha what happened there. Um, so starting from uh, pre-settlement pre times with indigenous use of the area and moving all the way up to the present day. Um, so additional public meetings were held in spring of 2020. Um, and one thing that uh, was a bit problematic with this study is because uh, because COVID happened, uh, it took a long time, especially to do the public engagement. Um, so it was a little bit chop and change with that, uh, but we really, we got it done. We had lots of different methods for that um, and we were able to engage with the community. Um, and so once we had those public meetings through April and May of this year, uh, the study was completed uh, with feedback from the public and feedback from our subcommittee. Um, and then the study was finalized. So that's, that's where we're at now is this final study. Um, so just to run through it, the main, there's some main sections of the study. Um, so we have our introduction and that includes the background of the study process, how it all works, our methodology, uh, a history of the area, an analysis of the character, uh, which is from our, our field surveys, a, a policy analysis that runs through um, how the study interacts with our current heritage policy, a summary of community engagement, and then also the recommendations coming out of the study. Uh, so the area history is extensive. Um, it covers a very long time, um, but there's some just sort of some key areas that we uh, that we touch on in it. So uh, the first is the indigenous use in the pre-settlement period. So um, Kawartha Lakes in general um, had a significant indigenous presence prior to white people showing up. Um, this particular area, um, it was definitely the Scugog River was definitely used as a traveling route. Uh, there's some evidence of there potentially being a campsite or portage in this area. 
Um, but it, that hasn't been by, confirmed by oral histories. Um, and I was I had conversations with Mississaugas of Skugog Island First Nation um, to discuss that oral history of the area. So we do know there was some indigenous use, uh, but nothing particularly specific in this area. Um, once we get into the 1820s uh, with the survey of Ox Township, this is when we get the establishment of the Purdy Mill. So this land was granted to William Purdy in the late 1820s, um, conditional of building a mill on the site. Uh, so he did that throughout the late 1820s and early 1830s, and a small settlement grew up around then, uh, and that was known as Purdy's Mills. So this was the main uh, mill site in Ops Township, um, and eventually the settlement got quite large. Um, and we move on to the incorporation of the town of Lindsay. Uh, so at the same time as Purdy's Mill was developing, um, a town site was surveyed next to it, um, which is our area of sort of Kent Street, um, which we, we now have our downtown in Lindsay in. Um, and in 1857, uh, the downtown and this Purdy's Mill settlement were incorporated together into the town of Lindsay. Um, and this was the time when the area was uh, surveyed into residential lots and more intensive residential development began during this period. Um, it was very close to downtown, um, close to various businesses along the river. Um, so people wanted to construct homes in this area. Um, throughout the second half of the 19th century and into the early 20th century, um, this residential development continued and intensified. Um, so we got a lot more homes in this area. Um, often lots were subdivided um, and redeveloped into more intense housing, particularly in sort of the 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, around that time period. And when really you get the bulk of the neighborhood development. Uh, moving on from that into the mid 20th century, um, there's the establishment of wartime houses, and then after around 1950, um, infill and new development, which has filled out the area into a mature residential neighborhood. Um, so the next section we have is our character analysis, um, and these were informed by the field surveys undertaken in winter of 2020 and 2021. Um, so myself and our subcommittee, we got out there, we took pictures of all the buildings, um, and our GIS staff took that data that we had, um, and developed uh, so a number of maps from that, uh, from that data. So the maps were used to analyze development patterns, um, and I'll show you some of them after this slide, um, just so you can see what they look like. Um, and from that, we found the primary building type was a one to two and a half story Victorian or Edwardian detached house set back from the street with soft landscaping. So this is the typical building within the study area, um, and there's lots of them. The other thing that we found was that the highest concentration of historic buildings was found in the northwest corner of the study area, um, so closer to uh, where Kent Street uh, meets with uh, Lindsay Street, um, and there are more modern buildings towards the southeast corner. So you'll notice the pattern of development, it's older, and as you move toward the southeast, it gets a lot newer. Uh, so you can see that in that, this map here. Uh, so your darker buildings are your older ones, and your lighter ones are your newer ones. Um, so you can see there's a lot more in the historic buildings in the, the northeast corner, and this corresponds with the, sorry, northwest corner, and this corresponds with its historic development. Um, and then looking down in the bottom corner, you're looking at a lot of newer buildings as well. So still there's some historic buildings dispersed throughout the study area, um, as well as some, some newer buildings uh, up, up near uh, the northwestern corner. But in general, you can see that pattern and how the development uh, proceeded from the mid 19th century up until today. Um, this one, this map here is just looking at a stylistic analysis of buildings. Um, so one thing that's interesting about this particular area is that it does not have a dominant architectural style. Um, there are a huge range of architectural style, styles that cover a wide range of Victorian and Edwardian periods um, or Edwardian types, as well as some properties that fall outside of that. So there's a, a large number of victory houses down in that southeast corner, um, particularly in that block um, bordered by Melbourne, Huron, Durham and Simcoe streets. Uh, so you can see that down there in the dark purple. Um, the other thing to notice is that there's a lot of vernacular housing in this uh, area. So that's your that's your historic housing um, that doesn't necessarily have a, a particular stylistic type, but it's sort of your, your average housing of the day. Um, so there's lots of it in this area. Um, and it's a particularly high concentration because vernacular, vernacular housing is often the first housing to be demolished and redeveloped. Um, so it's quite unique to see a, a large concentration of it as there is in this area. Um, this is just looking at the heights of the buildings. So you can see um, 
Most of them are in that one to two and a half story range. There's a few buildings that are higher than that. Um, really, actually, there's only two. So, so there's one uh, on Lindsay Street South, and that is 34 Lindsay Street South. So that's that three story Italianate uh, commercial building um, over there, uh, which fits more with the downtown character than it does with the residential. And then the other one is St. Mary's Church. Um, and that's it. Everything else is within that two and a half, one to two and a half story range. So it's, it's very consistent across the area. Um, and then this is with regard to front yard planting. So one of the big things we noticed was there was, there's a lot of soft landscaping, a lot of trees, a lot of gardens. Um, and this really characterizes a lot of houses um, across the district. So there's a few, or sorry, the study area. So there's a few that you can see that don't really have any of that. You know, they might have parking in the front yard or that sort of thing, but pretty much everything, they have nice soft landscaping out front and that helps inform the streetscape of the area. Uh, so the next thing that we moved on to is a policy analysis. Um, so this is required on the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, and basically it goes through every piece of, <laughs> every piece of policy that touches on heritage uh, that we have to deal with to make sure that a proposed designation is supported. Um, so that includes city, provincial and federal heritage, des heritage policies um, of which there are quite a few if, if you've had a look through the policy section. Um, so what we're really concerned with is our official plan and also the town of Lindsay official plan. Um, and they both have explicit wording that supports the designation of heritage conservation districts. So under the Ontario Heritage Act, um, your official plan must um, explicitly enable heritage conservation district designation. Um, and ours do because we, we have districts designated already. So that makes it quite easy. We also have another, a range of heritage related policies which support and guide heritage districts. Um, so in terms of a policy piece, we're in quite a good place. Um, and one thing that's important to note is that um, at the moment, uh, Lindsay has the town of Lindsay official plan. Uh, it will be superseded by the Lindsay Second Area Plan, which is currently under appeal. So when the appeal is dealt with, um, the Lindsay Second Area Plan will come into place. Uh, it's not yet, uh, but when it does, um, there is nothing within the designation that would conflict with the policies in the Lindsay Second Area Plan. So we're in compliance with those as well. Uh, so we won't have an issue when that comes into place. Uh, so policy-wise, we're, we're in good shape. Um, the next is with our public engagement. So there's uh, a fairly detailed summary of our public engagement, um, including um, statistics, as well as various items raised by members of the public throughout the study. Um, it was, public engagement was obviously very much complicated by the COVID-19 pandemic. We weren't able to have any in-person public meetings, which is unfortunate, uh, but uh, that was the reality of it. So if we do move on to the plan phase, we'll certainly be doing those in person. Uh, to make it easier for people. Um, we did hold four electronic public meetings, uh, which we had not too bad turnout with. Uh, you know, nobody wants to come to public meetings. So great, people showed up, uh, that's always good. Uh, we also used direct mail to inform and engage property owners. Um, so we sent a number of direct mail outs uh, to let people know what was happening, where we were at with the study, um, how to contact myself and where to access more resources. We also sent, um, surveys out to all property owners, uh, garnering feedback about the study, um, and also to get information about the study area. Uh, this was also posted online where people could access it. Um, we also made a jump in page, um, which is on our jump in is our public engagement platform. Um, so we had that on jump in and then we also had a web page on the city's website. So those those are there for public feedback. Um, we also did quite a bit of informal engagement uh, through the phone, email, and in-person discussions with residents and property owners. It's one of the nice things about the field surveys. We ran into a lot of people um, and were able to chat about the project with them. So there was quite a bit of feedback uh, and engagement that way, which was really nice, especially because we weren't able to have those in-person and more informal public meetings. Um, and in general, the community is supportive of the designation of the area as an HCD, which, which is really nice. Um, you don't really want to go into this with people really being opposed to it. Uh, there's definitely some voices within the local community who are not in favor of the area being designated, uh, but in general, most people would like all or part of the study area to be designated. So that is the that's the prevailing um, preference within this neighborhood. 
Um, so coming out of this, uh, we have some recommendations. Um, and what the, the recommendation is, is that a portion of the study area is designated as a district. And I have a map of that uh, portion on the next slide so we can have a look at that. Uh, the boundary that you'll see, it's smaller than the original study area. Um, so it excludes a large number of modern properties in the southeast corner of the neighborhood. So there's a lot of modern properties down there. They really don't need to be in an HCD. Um, so they have been excluded from the recommended boundary that will be presented to council. Um, and the recommendation is based on the area's historic value, both as the original settlement site of Lindsay and for its high concentration of Edwardian and Victorian residential properties. So that's, uh, that's the historic value of the area is that uh, the settlement site and its architectural value. So that's where the, uh, what the designation is based on. All right, so this is our recommended boundary here um, within the black line. So you'll see um, it excludes a couple of things and I'll just sort of run through that. Um, so it excludes quite a number of blocks in the bottom uh, southeast corner of the study area. They have a lot of modern properties on them and that's why they've been excluded. It also excludes um, all of Lindsay Street South and the corner of Durham Street East uh, next that sort of that touches on Lindsay Street South. Um, and the reason that those have been excluded um, is because that's a primarily commercial character. They really tie in a lot more closely uh, to downtown. Um, they're not within that kind of residential fabric, res suburban residential fabric that you see in the rest of the study area. So they don't really fit character wise with the rest of the area. So they have been excluded. Um, the other thing just to note is on the right hand side of your screen, you'll notice that the boundary sort of loops down uh, to pick up of four properties on Water Street there. Uh, so just let that one block there. Um, so that block includes the original site of the Purdy Mill. So that area was included just to make sure that that, uh, that site at the foot of Georgian Street was included in the area since the fact that it's the original settlement site is one of the reasons why <laughs> that we wanna designate this area. So that's why it looks a little funky down there on the Eastern side. All right, so next steps. Uh, well, so the next step is for this committee to endorse the study. So assu assuming that you do that, um, council will receive the study on July 19th. Um, so that's that's a council meeting. Uh, so I would be doing a presentation about it there um, and giving a, a rundown to council on what I've just talked to you guys about. Um, then if council endorses the study, the next step is to develop a heritage conservation district plan. Uh, so the plan is intended to guide future development to the area. It will include design guidelines, steps for permitting, um, visioning exercises for what people want to see this area develop into. Um, and this includes additional public consultation. So uh, we are required to have a statutory public meeting during the plan phase, uh, but we would obviously do more than that uh, because that's, that's what you want to do. You want to make sure that people are involved in the development of a plan that guides the future of their neighborhood. Um, I would anticipate a plan would take about 12 months to develop, uh, so the plan would be to take it forward to Council in around summer of 2023, you know, in, in about that 12 month range, uh, give or take. And then once the plan is complete, a bylaw is passed to adopt the plan and to designate the district, and that's that. Uh, then we have a new district. So step one is for Council to get it, or sorry, step one is for the Heritage Committee uh, yourselves to endorse it, and then it goes to Council. Uh, and then we go over there. So that is... That's the overview. Thank you very much for putting that in point form. It makes it a lot easier to go through and I'm sure it was easier for you too. So uh, do we have any questions or comments that we would like to make regarding this before the committee endorses it? Ron? Thanks, thanks Ethel, to you too. Emily, two questions on that map. It, am I correct to assume that the Academy Theater is not in that? And also the actual, the actual old mill itself is not deemed historical? Is that the old mill, The old mill is in the boundary and the Academy Theater is out. So the Academy Theater is already designated in the downtown Lindsay district. Uh, so you can't double designate something with districts. So the districts can't overlap. So the academy was automatically excluded, uh, but the old mill is included. So it's just up in the, the north, right on the north side of the river there. So it's it's in, hold on, I'll just share my screen again. It's so in, but it's not officially designated as, a, as an historic site, is that correct? Like, it's not mentioned. individually designated, no. So it, it will be designated as part of the district. Um, eventually when, uh, <laughs> when the yeah. district is designated. 
I've always wondered why it was never designated years ago, but anyway. <laughs> That's a very good question. I have, <laughs> I have wondered that as well. Okay, right, thanks. <laughs> Anyone else? Ian? Yes. Uh, Emily, you said the southeast uh, portion of the proposed area, um, the, the lines were redrawn to cut some of that out because of the preponderance of modern structures. Um, were any of the um, victory housing properties included within the boundary of the um, proposed study area or were they uh, cut out? There's a few of them in. So in the, um, so that concentration down in the southeast corner, it's out. Um, and the discussion was that those houses have a really specific character and a history that's really unique to them that doesn't really relate to the rest of the area. Um, so the discussion we had was to protect them separately. Um, what framework that would take, uh, we're not sure, but that, that's within the study itself. So it actually says that they should be protected uh, through a different framework than like a bunch of Victorian properties. There are some victory houses in the study area, like there's some random ones um, that just kind of show up. <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple on Kent Street uh, East, I know that. And there's a few other ones that are just peppered throughout the area. They're just infill from the forties. Um, but that, I mean, that does raise the question about what do we do about uh, that concentration of victory houses? And I think that that's a conversation that the committee should have, um, but separately from creating the area as a heritage district. I ask because the section on I think Melbourne Street East, I believe that was the very first batch of victory houses to go in, in the town of Lindsay. So that's why if they can be protected through some other means, that would be wonderful. I think. Yeah, one recommendation that's in the study is kind of a, a preliminary until we figure out what to do with them uh, recommendation is that everything that's built before 1950 that's outside of the study area boundaries. So that would include the victory houses, but also all those like rando properties on Lindsay Street um, that they be listed on the register just so they're not demoed um, while we figure out what to do with them. Good. I think we discussed maybe in the future um, creating another heritage conservation district to celebrate those uh, that period of history as well. So, um, just to I jump think in that, on. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I think that uh, protecting them by listing them for the for the time being is probably the safest thing we can do. One thing I was just going to say is that something that the committee might want to think about is that there's a couple of other highly concentrated areas of victory housing in Lindsay and they're all pretty small um, and it may be worthwhile dealing with all of them together as one thing. Uh, you'd end up with a, a discontinuous heritage district but you know who cares about that that's not a big deal uh, we can do that um, and that may that might be something that the committee should think about um, because then you have a comprehensive approach to victory housing across Lindsay. Any further questions for Emily regarding this heritage conservation district study? All right, uh, may I have someone make a motion to? Uh, endorse this Heritage Conservation District study as presented this evening. I have Jim first and Ian second. All those in favor? Unanimously agreed. Thank you. That was a big chunk of information and uh, I thank you for putting it together for us, Emily, in such a concise manner. Thank you. So the next thing on our agenda then is the designation of a property at 761 Salem Road in Mariposa. So could you inform us about this, Emily? Yep, I'll give the rundown. Uh, so this is an owner requested designation. Um, this property was actually proposed for listing um, and 
council recommended or committee the whole recommended listing it last week uh, and in the interim the owners requested that it be designated uh, which is fine it's all very easy um, it's a an interesting log house uh, in Mariposa Township it's very large um, I don't know if anyone's been sort of to that area of Salem Road but there's quite a concentration of log houses down there um, and this is, this is the big guy on the north side um, so it's quite unique uh, because it's constructed in the Georgian style which is pretty rare for log houses uh, in Court Lake and also just in general. Um, it's also very well preserved for a log house. Um, you don't see too many of them around. I mean, they're pretty rare. Uh, they got torn down, a lot of them got torn down in the 19th century. So um, it's good to have one of these preserved. Uh, it also has historical associations with the, uh, the local settler who built it. And it yields a lot of information just through his family about um, the settlement in the township in the mid 19th century. Uh, we don't really know the date of construction on it. Uh, it's, some, it's sometime in the middle of the 19th century, um, possibly the early 1860s, but we don't really know for sure. Um, and it also supports the historic agricultural character of rural Mariposa Township. Um, which is, you know, it's agricultural and rural in that area around Little Britain, um, and this property fits right in. Uh, the other thing that's not noted, it's noted in the, the larger evaluation report, uh, but not in the covering report, um, is that this is a pretty intact 19th century historic farmstead, um, and it's a good example of a cultural heritage landscape. Um, so it's, it's all there. Um, everything is uh, the barns, the outbuildings, the, uh, the house. Um, so, I mean, the main thing is the house. It's really the unique bit, but if you look at it together as a unit, uh, you have a, a very lovely cultural heritage landscape um, that shows a mid 19th century agricultural settlement. So it's, uh, it's very nice. Um, yeah, that's it. There's interior features um, as well, which is something that we, we seem to be doing more and more of, but it's really because the owners keep asking for it and that's fine, I'm good with that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the overview. All right. Are there any questions or comments relating to this proposed designation? I think it's wonderful that we're finally getting to designate some things that are agricultural um, rather than all city driven or town driven. So I, I think this is quite a remarkable property, especially the style of it and it being two story is it's quite amazing. So, any comments? Anne? I just want to say how much I always enjoy reading these that Emily puts together. That You do such a wonderful job, Emily. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. I really like writing these, so I probably <laughs> take way too much time doing them, but I'm like, oh, yes, I got to do research. <laughs> I think you do a marvelous job. I enjoy reading every one of them, and I'm so happy that you've included you know, the whole sort of landscape around it, as well as just the house. So could I have a motion from the committee to endorse the designation of this property at 761 Salem Road in Mariposa? Anne, do I have a seconder? Sandy, all those in favor? It is unanimously approved. Thank you very much. So we'll move on now to the next, which is an alteration application for 78 Bond Street West in Lindsay, which is to bring about more accessibility to the home. So again, Emily, do you want to proceed and tell us yeah. about this? I'll give the rundown. Uh, so this is a design an individually designated property in Lindsay. It's a 19th century house. Um, the owners of this property, um, need some, shall we say, fairly urgent um, accessibility modifications to allow them to continue to live in the house. Um, so this is, a, this is a little bit different from what we usually receive because we don't have specific drawings because they don't have them yet. Um, but because there's a time sensitive nature of this, um, I wanted to bring it forward to the committee for conditional approval um, while they get their ducks in a row. Um, so there's a few things they want to do. Uh, the first is to install a ramp at the rear entrance of the property. Um, so this is from the rear door and it would include a platform. Uh, actually, I'm going to show some pictures. Hold on a second. I think I have them on deck here. Um, sorry, two seconds. Um, 
Oh yeah, here we go. Okay. Um, just so you you can see something while I'm talking at you. All right. Uh, that's the door. Um, so the first thing. So this is the rear entrance. Uh, you can't see this from the street. Um, it's around the back. Uh, so. The, I mean, the first thing they want to do is to re repair the brickwork, uh, which they don't actually need a heritage permit for, uh, but they need to do it. Uh, so they're going to do that first before they install the ramp. Um, and then they're going to install a ramp. So it'll have a, a platform that goes out and then a ramp that runs to the driveway, um, which is here, just so that they can access the driveway from there. Um, so it's going to be a low platform and it will include metal railings that match the fence. Um, it'll look like this. They won't be spiky on top, but it will be this look. Um, and they're getting specifications for that. So that's step number one. Uh, the next is to install railings on the front step. So there'll be railings on both sides of the steps. Once again, low profile, that black uh, matte cast iron look um, to match with the age of the property. Um, and then the last one is to, uh, this is the door um, and they want to install um, a glass panel in the middle so really what they would end up doing is cutting out the entire middle section and putting a glass panel in um, and the reason for this is so that uh, anyone on the front steps walking down can be seen from the inside of the hall um, as, a, as a safety precaution uh, for the occupants of the house um, and this door I don't know what the vintage of this door is but it's not included in the designation bylaw so it's, I don't think it's original to the house, having a look at it, um, but it's, it's not in the bylaw, so it's not a heritage feature of the property. Um, so they preserve the look, but put glass in the middle. Um, and that's what they're uh, looking at doing. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Um, yeah, that's it. So they've, they've just given rough specifications while they get the drawings done, um, because it's, it's a fairly urgent project, so they didn't want to wait. Um, so what I've, uh, or I'm just going to stop sharing. Uh, what I've requested is that the committee provide, uh, in principle, conditional approval um, based on the submission of the drawings and the specifications for the railings. Um, so that, that would uh, allow them to to move forward with conditional approval if they submit those and they are satisfactory. All right, any questions or comments regarding this presentation? I think as long as we say that it's conditional on the provision of um, the drawings and specifications, um, I think this could give them the feeling that they can go ahead. Yeah, and that's, I think that's really what they need is they, they need to know that they can, can move forward um, since they do need to get this done quite quickly. So there being no questions, do I have someone willing to move that this is approved, uh, provided that the proper drawings and specifications are provided? I had first hand from Skip, second from Jim. All those in favor? Carried, thank you. All right, we move on to the last portion of our agenda, section five. Um, which is the subcommittee updates. So 5.1 is the subcommittee uh, designated property subcommittee. And we recently had a meeting. So Emily, um, would you like to go through that? Uh, sure, thanks, Ethel. So I circulated the minutes for these as well, um, se separately from the agenda. Um, so this was the, the kickoff meeting for this particular group. Um, so this is the group that's discussing sort of property standards with regard to designated properties. So we did a little bit of um, a goal setting in terms of what we wanted to do. Um, so the two main goals were to undertake property surveys of city owned heritage buildings and take condition photographs. Um, and then also to implement a section of the city's property standards bylaw that dealt with heritage. Um, so the, uh, the outcomes from this were to, so looking at the policy side first, because that's kind of the easier one, um, I've been drafting some wording regarding property standards, um, so it would circulate that draft to the subcommittee for review, and we'd work with um, our enforcement staff to get that implemented into the property standards bylaw. 
Um, and then the next was to do uh, these condition assessments. So we'll be using the ArcGIS collector app uh, for data collection and taking photographs. Um, and then those can upload directly into the city's GIS system um, to make it easy to, to do data management for those. Um, so I'm gonna reach out to community services staff to make sure that we have access to the buildings. Um, and then our, uh, our subcommittee, we're gonna go in teams um, and start taking, uh, start taking pictures, collecting data on the various buildings. So that is, um, that's that. Any questions from the committee to the subcommittee? All right, there being none, may I have somebody move the acceptance of this report for information? Skip. Seconded by John, all those in favor. Thank you, carried. The next is the doors open subcommittee and you've provided a report that's within our package. And Ian, would you like to speak towards to this report? Yes, thank you, Ethel. I believe that report um, reflects a meeting that was held on the 6th of May, which seems like an awfully long time ago now. And the committee will not actually be meeting again, I think until July 11th or 12th or 14th, Laura, somewhere in there. July 11th, hopefully around two. Okay, so in the meantime though, um, work has been progressing on doors open. Um, certainly from, from my end at least, um, We've got two churches within Lindsay that have agreed to participate on September 11th, St. Mary's Church and St. Andrew's Church. Um, I have also been uh, in touch by email and I know Emily has been in touch by telephone with the folks who run the blacksmith shop in Argyle, now the antique store. Um, it looks like they've done some work on that building. Uh, my mom and I were out there on Saturday and it looks quite nice now. Um, I also plan to be in touch with the, uh, the bakery in Argyle, which was formerly in the Royal Hotel. And these two sites are being considered because um, they are good examples of how historic buildings have been uh, adaptively reused. Uh, the theme again for doors open this year is design. Um, and that's really all I have to say. Uh, Laura, do you have anything to add to that? Um, one thing that uh, has puzzled me a little bit, and I know it's kind of puzzled Emily too, is traditionally when we've done doors open in the past, whether it's been through this committee or a few years ago, it was sort of a joint effort with the Quartha Lakes Culture and Heritage Network. Um, there was a lot of back and forth with the uh, representatives from the Ontario Heritage Trust. There were about uh, three gentlemen down in Toronto who would email us fairly frequently. Um, and there just seems to be kind of radio silence uh, on that front. I don't know if it has to do with the fact that, um, you know, for the past two years, this has been largely virtual uh, and we haven't had to pay registration fees or what's going on there, but it just seems kind of odd. Uh, Laura or Emily, do you have anything to add to that? I talked to them yesterday, actually. Oh, wonderful. Um, mostly because I emailed and said, ah, talk to me about stuff. Um, so no, they're not, they're pretty much not sending anything out, um, but uh, we can reach out directly to them if we want stuff. Um, I had spoken to them yesterday about the website because uh, it still says we're doing a digital only event. Uh, so I got that fixed um, and we should have our in-person event site up. I don't know, shortly they said, but who the hell knows what that means. Um, July, August, I don't know at some point. So we'll, we'll start. Um, we have the capacity to put the individual in-person sites onto the website now. Um, so Ian, if you wanna flip me who is confirmed, I'll start uploading them to the website. I've already put the blacksmith shop on because I talked to them. Sure. Um, the only other update from that is we talked about having Mary Burrow Lodge on and I talked to Glenn yesterday as well. Um, and he's keen to be on, but he doesn't know when the construction is starting for the project that we just approved earlier <laughs> this evening. Um, so if, uh, it just depends on when they're planning on starting the construction. So they might be 
in demolition mode on the 11th. Um, but he's going to get back to me about that. Did he talk to you about the other uh, changes that are going to be made to Maryborough that we approved last? Uh, well, the meeting before last. No, we which just were the pillars. That. No, we so. didn't talk about that at all. We just talked about doors open. So we don't have a time frame on that either. No. Okay. All right, Ian. I should say, you know, part of the doors open um, experience. It's not just going, you know, into buildings, but it's also sort of experiencing kind of what goes on in, in these sites and. That, that has included in the past things like taste and music and art and so forth. And uh, I've made tentative arrangements for a cousin of mine to come up and play an organ recital at St. Andrew's Church on the afternoon of September 11th. Um, so that may be an interesting kind of added, added feature. So more details forthcoming. Wow, that would be wonderful. All right, any questions? So may I have someone move the acceptance of this report for information? Anne, may I have a seconder? Sue, Sandy, all those in favor? Thank you, approved. So <clears throat> the sign subcommittee. So I'll turn this to you, Jim. The signage subcommittee, Jim. Sorry, I had a problem finding myself here. So it, uh, uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> Yeah, I have nothing more to uh, uh, to update. We we had attempted a, a couple of possible dates, and and uh, circumstances did not work out. So, we'll try to uh, find another uh, um, workable date and and do this as quickly as possible. So. Do we need to accept that report or? No, I didn't think so. No. Okay, um, Pickerel Point. So I'll turn it over to you, Ron. Um, not a lot has not a lot has happened since the last. I did contact, try to contact Karen Freely with Trans Severn Waterway, but I haven't heard back from her yet. She was the contact that we had, so one of the contacts. So I'm just waiting to hear back, and then I'll update the subcommittee on that, on the cabin. So right now, just status quo as they are. So nothing's been taken away or there's been no mention of any demolition of these structures yet. So no news is good news in that, but you know, I'm not sitting on it. I'm just trying to get a hold of these, these people and uh, these TSW representatives just to make sure that, you know, we wanna, we wanna still deal with these structures. We're not, we don't want to be forgotten, put it that way. So I'm trying to get a hold of them. And uh, that's sort of where it's at right now. Thank you. Do we need a motion to accept that one, Emily? So we've had an update from Councillor Ashmore regarding the Pickle Point. So may I have someone move the information? I think Anna had a question. Uh, provided. Pardon? I think Anne had a question, maybe, or maybe she had her hand up for a second. <laughs> I did have a question, but if you can go ahead with the motion, I can ask my question later. Okay. Um, do we have anyone re ready to move the acceptance of this report? Jim, seconded by. Yes. Skip, all those in favor. Thank you, carried. And is your question pertinent to this or? Yes, um, just of uh, Ron, 
did you ever um, track down any ownership information? Because I believe that's what the TSW was actually looking for. Not yet. I wish I could say yes, but not yet. You know, we've we've got some names, and I've I've asked our solicitor to help me out in the realty division, realty services in the city, but I haven't got any anything of concrete nature really to report. Sorry, yeah. Um, as of yet, but I'm still trying to get some ownership on these on these buildings, on these cottages. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, moving forward, we come to the correspondence uh, portion and we have an updated Committee of Council Orientation package, um, which Emily has provided to us. Would you like to make comment, Emily? Sure, so this is just an updated version of the orientation package for all committees. Um, everyone will have gotten this at some point uh, when you join the committee. Uh, Clerk's office has just done a few updates to it because they, uh, they've updated some policies. I will be perfectly honest with you. I don't actually know what the updates are because I, I haven't read it. Um, so the, clerk, the clerk's office um, has asked that this be presented to committees, uh, that you formally receive it for information and that you read it in your own time. Um, it's always good to have an update, uh, so just have a quick flip through it when you get a chance. Um, but we do need to put a motion to receive it, and then we're good to go. All right. May I have a motion to receive this updated policy? Ian, and seconded by Councillor Ashmore. All those in favor? Carried. Is there any new or other business? Um, I have a heritage inventory update. If you don't mind me running through that. Okie dokie. So the heritage inventory is launching in the next couple of weeks, which is really exciting. So I sent out uh, an email to everybody with the background information on stuff, uh, but I just wanted to bring it up here in case people wanted to ask questions or discuss any of it. Uh, so the big things, um, we are having three public meetings. Uh, we're going to launch in Bethany and Bob Cajun. Um, so we have one for each of those communities. And then we're also doing an online one for people who don't uh, feel comfortable attending in-person meetings or who can't. Um, and also so I can record it and put it online uh, so people can watch it later. That's the easiest way of doing it is just to run a Zoom. Um, so our Bob Cajun meeting is on Sunday, the 26th of June from 12 to 2 um, at the arena in that upstairs room there. Um, and then the, which I guess is called the Bob Cajun Rural and Community Center, but it's the arena. Anyways, um, and then our Bethany meeting is on Wednesday, June 29th from seven to 9 p.m. in the Bethany United Church. Um, and it's just in, in the hall there. It's not in the church itself. Um, so we'll be running uh, a meeting. So the meetings are really just to, uh, to provide an overview of the project, let people, um, sort of know what's happening, they can ask questions, and then also to solicit volunteers, because um, we definitely want some community volunteers to participate in this. Um, so Laura and myself are gonna be there, as well as Megan, one of our summer students, she's gonna be helping us out, which is great. Um, and if people from the Heritage Committee wanna come um, and sort of meet and greet and be involved so we can introduce you, be like, these are, <laughs> this is our Heritage Committee, these are our experts, please feel free to come out. Uh, that would be great. Um, so if, if you've let me know if you're coming, that would be great. Just so we kind of know who's who's going to be there. Um, that would be wonderful. And then we're also the online one is on July 5th from seven to nine in the evening. There's really no reason for you to come to that one. Uh, it's probably just going to be me speaking into dead air. So um, it's really just a repeat of what was at the other ones. But if you if you do feel like listening to me talk about the project again, then feel free to register. Uh, so you can uh, you can register online in advance for that. Um, I am just going to pull up uh, the other things. So we have a website, uh, a page on the city's website, which I will show you, and then also a page on Jump In. I don't have these on deck clearly, so just bear with me for two seconds. May I ask you to repeat the information about Bethany? Uh, it is Wednesday, June 29th from 7 to 9 at the Bethany United Church.
Okay, so this is our page on the city website. Uh, it's under our heritage designation page. So you have to kind of work down a little bit to get to it. Uh, this provides all the background information on the project. I'll update it um, as necessary. It's really just an information landing page. Um, so it's got the background, shows how to get involved, where the public meetings are, information about our ongoing inventories, FAQs, and then project documents. So those are there. Um, we also have jump in, um, which, oh, hold on. That is the zoning bylaw. Uh, we don't care about that right now. Sorry, John, I know that's your, <laughs> that's your project. Um, okay, so this is our jump in page. So for those of you who haven't used jump in before, it's our online engagement platform that we use at the city. Um, so this also has all the information on it. A lot of it's repeats, um, but it has our key dates here, just showing when the public meetings are, uh, various little news articles about what's happening, project documents that people can access. Um, we also have some interactive elements on here as well. Uh, so places where people can add stories about different uh, events or history of the community. So people can add stuff on there. Uh, there is a map where people can drop pins about where different historic places are. So if you like zoom, we'll go down to Bethany. Oh dear, okay. Uh, uh, so if people are like, oh, we want to put something in in Bethany, uh, they can drop, you know, drop a pin down here wherever they want and just write like, this is the old post office, like that kind of stuff. Um, and then we also have, so, um, oh, the survey is just volunteer sign up. So if people want to help out with stuff, they can sign up there. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with the study. Uh, Timeline wise, we'll have the public meetings in the next few weeks. Um, and then we're looking at doing the inventorying in July and August. Uh, the Bethany one was, will probably take a day. Uh, Bethany is not very big. Uh, with a few volunteers, we can get her done uh, quite quickly. Uh, the Bob Cajun one's gonna take a little bit longer. So we'll see what we have volunteer wise, like who wants to help out from the community. I know we, we definitely have some people in both communities who are interested, which is really exciting. Um, and it would be great for people on this committee to, to help out with that surveying as well, and also be kind of a, a bit of a team lead on the surveying since uh, you guys are our experts um, and our heritage committee members. So if you're interested in doing that, let me know as well. I will make sure that you guys have all the information uh, so that if our volunteers ask you stuff, <laughs> ask you stuff, you, you know what to, uh, you know what to tell them. Uh, the other thing we have is we have some little postcard handouts, which are just out of reach. Hold on a second, I'm gonna go grab one. Um, oh, there's one back there. Sorry. They're all over the place. Okay. Uh, these are our little handouts uh, that we have. They're little postcard si size things. We'll have them at the public meetings. Uh, so they have this on the front. And then they have some information on the back. Um, these are, well, they're for a couple things. They're for handing out at the public meetings. And also when people go out and about in the community, I'm going to send them out with these. Uh, so if people ask about the project, they can just hand them out. Um, so if someone's like, why are you random person taking a photo of my house, they can provide something official uh, from the city to the property owner. Um, and we'll have ID for people as well, like lanyards that say volunteer, all that kind of stuff too. So uh, yeah, so that's where we're at. Hopefully we'll have the two inventories done by the end of the summer. Uh, and then I'll have to clean up all the data, but that's my problem. So, <laughs> so I will do that later. Um, and that's, yeah, that's it. So let me know if you want to be involved. It's really exciting. Hopefully it goes really well this summer because we've been doing it for the next 10 years. And I'm not joking when I say that. So will you be giving those of us who are perhaps dinosaurs uh, some help with how we use the system? I know yes. I downloaded it the other day, but I need some help to the learn how to use it yeah so what we'll do is for people who want to help out we'll, we'll run a tra a little training session at some point in july for for you guys on the committee we'll coordinate a date um and i will run through with you how it all works uh and then if people ask you questions you can answer them um and we'll also do training for our volunteers as well just so they know what's up so we'll do um we're gonna try and do a lot of the collect the data collection on the g on the arcgis collector app uh just because that makes it easier for me to keep the data in our GIS system. Uh, but I'm also gonna be providing paper copies of the survey forms for people because some people just are not comfortable using technology at all, um, which is fine. And if they still wanna participate, then that is, that's great. They can do it on paper and I will just type stuff in. It's not a big deal. Um, 
So we'll we'll try and do stuff technology based, but we'll we'll have the we'll have the hard copy option as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, do we have any other questions relating to this report from Emily? Nope. May I have someone move that we accept it for information? Ian, may I have someone second it? And all those in favor? Carried. All right. Our next meeting, Emily. Um, oh, I think Anne has a question. Before oh, we get sorry, Anne. I didn't see oh, you no, down just, there. Um, under new business, I just wanted to let the committee know, I think some of you already know, but the Edgewood Wall and Bob Cajun uh, restoration project was completed yesterday. And what a fantastic job it was too. We they did worked find, even uh, in the pouring rain. And with broken feet. Yes. <laughs> we Amazing. did find an interesting um, thing in, in the second part of the wall. I think I told the committee and when we did the Western wall, they found some wooden shims that tied it so that we know that the person who built it is probably the same person who did the uh, laid law fences. But in the second uh, restoration, in the eastern wall, um, we found belting instead of through stones, um, and they looked pretty old. They actually reinstalled them back into the wall when they were rebuilding it, but we were um, contemplating whether or not they could have been from the Boyd sawmills um, because they were belts from that type of industry. So anyways, we put them back in the wall, but I just thought that was something interesting that the group might like to know. <laughs> Did you take a photographic essay of these things? So maybe it could be exhibited in the void? I actually kept one, but I did take photos. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, anything else? Should we move that that's received for information or it's just a comment? It's just a comment, I think. Okay, thank you. All right, so the next meeting date. Um, so generally we don't have a meeting in July. Um, so I don't think we're gonna have to have one. Um, so let's, we'll say our next meeting is August 4th. Um, and I am really hoping we're gonna be back in council chambers. Uh, things are opening back up, so fingers crossed um, that we will be in person. So it'll be hybrid in case people wanna join on Zoom, um, but that will be, uh, that'll be August 4th, uh, but just keep July 7th penciled off in your calendar just in case. I don't think we're going to have to meet, but if we have like a, a heritage permit application or a planning application, then we might have to, uh, but we'll aim for the 4th and we might see you on the 7th. <laughs> All right, thank you. So may I have someone make a motion to adjourn? I have... And Jim with both hands. And do I have a seconder? I think I saw Anne. So thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Um, we appreciate it. And have a good, I guess, month or two off. And we'll see you in August. So no, we'll see you at the public, we'll see you at the public meetings. The public meetings. Oh yes. Some of us. <laughs> so 